Okay, here we go. Right? We talked about the origin and the insertion. Now, let's talk about first prime movers. Okay? These are kind of like functional groups. Prime movers, P R I M E M O V E R S, right? If I grab a dumbbell and I do a curl and lift it up, right? The muscle that's doing most of the work is my biceps, right? That's the prime mover. Yes? The prime mover. Yes? Okay? Another word for that is agonist. A G A N O I S T. Agonist. Right? Okay. It means like leader. Now, uh, the opposite is the antagonist. Antagonist. That means against the leader. Okay? Against the leader. Yes? Let me explain. When I take that curl and I do this, and I curl, this is the prime mover. But guess what? Thank you so much. Yeah. When I do this, this is the prime mover, but guess what? This triceps on the back here, right? It's active somewhat too. And it is the opposite or the counterbalance. <coughs> if I did not have that triceps there to slow the movement down and to make the movement smoother, then if there was only biceps, movement would be very jerky and not smooth and you'd have a hard time tracking that safe, right? Which takes very fine movement, see? Okay, so the prime mover, right? The agonist or the leader and the opposite, the antagonist, okay? It slows down movement it regulates the action of the prime movers, and it pre provides resistance, okay? Provides resistance, okay? Synergist, S-Y-N-E-R-G-I-S-T. What does synergy mean? What does synergy mean? Anybody familiar with that word? Okay. Synergy means this. It means when two things work together and they help each other out and you get a better outcome, right? Yes? If you're in a group and you got to come up with an idea and one guy comes up with an idea and somebody else goes, oh yeah, that's a great idea, but this would make it better, right? And somebody else goes, oh yeah, that's great, I like that idea, da, 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 but this would be even better, right? and they work synergistically together to get a good result, okay? So synergy means working together, right? So synergists, they do a couple of things. They help the prime mover, okay? They help the prime mover. Sometimes they add extra force, okay? Sometimes they add extra force, right? Here we have gluteus Maximus, medius, and minimus. There's three different muscle groups there, right? But, but the medius and the minimus help the maximus, right? To have better and stronger motion, yes? Then, S-Y-N means together. Erg means work, right? Have you heard that word ergonomics? Okay. Uh, my first adventure bike, my KLR, yes? We sit and we ride a bunch, but then when we get off in the dirt, we always stand up on the pegs. So we can do this with the motorcycle and move around, right? And we're going around a corner, and if you're on the pavement, you lean with the, right? But if you're on the dirt and it's really loose, you go around the corner, you lean the bike and you lean the other way to put weight on the tires. It's totally opposite out from the dirt when it's very loose, right? 
And one of the things we do is from sitting to standing, I'm pretty tall, so I had to put bar riders on there. And the bar raise risers raise the handlebar up an inch and a half. So when I'm standing up like this with the knees bent, then I can control the motorcycle. If I didn't have the bar risers, I'm further down like this, I'm bent over, not near so comfortable because we do that for hours at a time, see? So, uh, so ergonomics, right? Uh, you know, uh, where you set your computer, what the eye level is, where you set your pad you're typing from, right? That's all ergonomics, okay? So synergist, right? Now, let's also talk about fixators. F-I-X-A-T-O-R-S, fixators, okay? Two examples of that, okay? Now, in order for me to bend my fingers, right, that's these muscles on the inside of the forearm, right? Yes? And so what happens is this. If only these muscles on the inside of the forearm contracted, I would do this. Right? Yes? But I have the ability to do this, and this, and this, and this, right? Note, I'm not bending my wrist. Because whenever I don't want to bend my wrist and just want to bend the fingers, I have fixators over here on the back side. You can feel it when you do that, right? The back part over here works too, and it fixates this wrist so the wrist doesn't bend. If you only had the flexors working, I would do that every time. I wouldn't be able to do that. I can do that because fixators back here are holding my wrist in position. Okay? If you look at, you, at yourself from the back, right, you have those vertebrae, right? And then over here you have that shoulder blade, those shoulder blades, yes? And the shoulder blade does this. It actually does this too, but anyway, when that happens, when your humerus is going in different positions, well, rhomboids are across here, and the rhomboids sometimes contract and tighten up to hold this still so my arm can come way up here. It wouldn't work if there was nothing to, if the uh, muscles on the top of the, pardon me, Superspinatus, if it didn't have something solid to pull against, it wouldn't work, see? So, sometimes the rhomboids act as fixators to hold this in place so I can move my arm like this without my shoulder blade doing that, okay? So that's a fixator, yes? And realize, too, uh, postural muscles are fixators. They hold me up, yes? Otherwise, I would fall down. Right? But they hold tension on those bones and keep me standing up. And realize another thing too. In certain motions, when I do this, this is the prime mover. Right? Oh, by the way, when I do this, that's the prime mover. So a muscle, this is the prime mover, and this is the antagonist. So... You can't say, oh, biceps, that's a prime mover. Well, in certain motions, yes, but in other motions, it's the antagonist. What I'm getting at is, this is describing what's going on, but this is not a concrete, this is always the prime mover. Does that make sense? Because we move joints this way, but we also move joints that way, the opposite way, yes? Okay? So realize that, that, uh, that, uh, 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 these terms are flexible as far as uh, different motions. You have to talk about the motions first, right? Now, okay, we talked about the Vitruvian man, right, Leonardo. This is an anatomical position. And, and muscles on the front of the joint usually cause, usually cause flexion. Muscles on the back of the joint usually cause extension. Right? Muscles on the medial part of the joint usually cause abduction. Muscles on the outside of the joint 
or more laterally, I should say, um, are abductors. Raise up, abductors. Okay, does that make sense? The front of the joint, flexors, extensors, adductors, and abductors, right? Depending on which side of the joint they're on, okay, commonly. Okay? A muscle may act as a prime mover in one movement and antagonist for another movement and a synergist for a third movement. Okay? Let's talk about the names of muscles. Sometimes muscles are named because the shape they are, right? Okay? Uh, right? Deltoid. Right? Right, the Greek letter delta, deltoid, yes? Oh, by the way, this one. Right? Trapezoid. Right? What are these muscles? They start here, they come across to your shoulders, they come down and attach. Da, 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 da. These are traps. traps, right? These are traps. Yes? And what, that what it says on the do? Trapezius? Yes? Okay. And such. So, now, some of the words that are used, right? Some of the words that are used to name a muscle. Longus and brevis, right? Longus, right? It's a long muscle. What does brevis mean? Brevity is the soul of wit, right? Yes? Yes? Okay. Rodney Dangerfield, the king of the one-liners, right? Hey, that was no lady. That was my wife, right? Very short, not a five-minute story. Yes? Brevity, short. So, brevis means short. Longest means long. Okay? Now, maximus, minimus. Right, we talked about that. Right, you got your gluteus maximus, medius, minimus. Okay, maximus being the big one, then the medius and the minimus. Yes. Okay. Now, muscles can have more than one origin. Yes. Your bicep actually there's two parts to it. Right, and hence it's called bi bi for two biceps. Now, on the back of your arm, back here, yes, there are actually three heads. One, two, three. And they all come together. So you can do that, right? So that is triceps, right? Oh, by the way, by the way, what are these down here called? Your quads? Your quads, right? Guess how many there are? Uno, dos, three. Quattro, four, right? Four, yes? Okay, so quad. So sometimes the number of heads is the name of a muscle. A muscle is named for the number of heads that it has. Okay? Okay. Now. I'm going to need to do a little diagram. I did not know we were going to have to learn some engineering. We're going to have to learn a little bit of mechanical engineering next, right? Okay. Get this right here. Okay. This is uh, figure 10.4. Okay, figure 10.4. Take me just a minute to draw these, right?
Okay, let me explain. Our bones are levers. A lever is a rigid bar, right? Our joints are fulcrums, okay? The muscles provide the effort. So we have to talk about primary, uh, first class, second class, and third class levers, yes? Now, when you have small children, you take them to the park, and you put them on the seesaw, right? Yes? And I put both of my kids on one end, yes? And in the middle is where it pivots, right? That's the fulcrum, yes? And even though when the kids got pretty big, I could just do this, right? To make that seesaw go up and down. It wasn't hard. Why? Because this is a first class lever. This is the length of the lever. This is the lever. This is the fulcrum. It didn't take much effort pushing down, right? To make the load go up, my kids sitting there, yes? That's a first class lever system. And we have mechanical advantage using a lever system, a, a, a first class lever. We have mechanical advantage, right? Yes? Now, let's see, our example in the, in the book is this. Our face has weight and, and the joint here that the uh, uh, occipital Atlanto joint between the skull and the first vertebrae is the fulcrum, right? And normally our face would is the weight of it, but we have muscles back here that contract to hold the head up, right? And that is an example of a first class lever in the body, right? It's the head. And again, the pivot point, the fulcrum is right here. The load is the weight pulling down. The effort, that's those muscles creating the effort to keep you looking straight ahead, right? What, was the, what did the Greek Archimedes say? Give me a lever long enough and I will move the world, okay? Because a lever with the fulcrum placed properly gives you mechanical advantage. Okay? Now, the second one, the second class lever, okay? The second class lever. No, the fulcrum at the front, or at one end, the load here, and the effort here, okay? Now, what is our example of that? Right? What is that, folks? This is cement, by the way. Blueberry? It's blueberry, yes. Right? Now. I can put two sacks of cement in my wheelbarrow, add the water, stir it all up. Sacks of cement are 80 pounds each, right? So I got 160 pounds plus another 10 or 15 pounds of water in there, right? And then what do I do? Pick it up and I just roll it around in the backyard no matter, dump it wherever I want it, right? Yes? So the wheelbarrow is an example of a second class lever. And it's not hard to move. It's not hard to move that cement around, even though it weighs a lot, because I also have mechanical advantage, right? Right? My house was built in 1906. So I had to replace the plumbing. And it took me months, and I did it myself with some help from my two boys when they were like 9 and 11 years old, yes? And I had to replace the main sump. It was a cast iron pipe about that big around, 
and it was, uh, I don't know, it's 23 feet to the peak of the roof, and it went that much higher. But it also went down in the basement below the floor, too, so the pipe had to be 30 feet long. Well, I was not strong enough to get a hold of that and pull that up and hook the drain pipe on the bottom, right? So what I did was I stacked bricks. I got a two by six. I put it under the edge of that pipe and I'm in the crawl space and my, thank God, my crawl space is that tall. So I'm like this, but anyway, and I did this. And I lifted up probably 250, 300 pounds of pipe <laughs> by using a lever system, right? Because I understand levers. See, any other way, there's no way I was walking over there and grabbing a hold of that pipe and doing this and lifting up 300 pounds. No way, right? But by using a two by six and a stack of bricks, and by hooking it under the pipe, the edge of where, where the pipe had some wheels that came out, hooking it on that, I was able to lift that up, and get the other pipe underneath there, and then set it down, put the collar on it, you see. So, in a second class lever, you also have mechanical advantage, but notice, when you do a wheelbarrow, you only lift the cement about this high, don't you? Not very far, right? Now, when you use a first class lever, whoa, you get a lot of motion. Yes, not very much because of where your fulcrum is placed. But anyway, that's the second class lever, right? Our example of that in the body is when we stand on our tiptoes, right? The balls of our feet are the fulcrum, yes? The effort, of course, is my calf muscles, right? And the, the foot is the uh, lever. The muscles of the feet are the lever, right? Right? The ball of your foot is the fulcrum. This is the lever. This is the effort up here. That's the second class lever, okay? Actually, our body does not use first and second class levers very much. We mainly use third class levers. Okay? First class lever is called a power lever because you got a lot of power, right? You can lift a lot of weight. Okay? Now, the third class lever. The third class lever is the uh, uh, speed lever, right? Okay. A third class lever is a speed lever, and and our body uses third class levers a lot, right? Now you, you do not you lose mechanical advantage. Okay, you lose mechanical advantage. However. You can move something a long ways. Okay? My example of that is okay. Right? That's a shovel, folks. Okay? So the load is all the dirt I'm picking up in that shovel. Right? And the way you work a shovel is your back hand right up here, right? That's the fulcrum. So I work the shovel and I pick the dirt up and I can pick it up from there and throw that dirt way over there if I want to, right? Yes? But I, 
The effort is my front arm. That's where I'm picking the dirt up. Pick it up, swing around, set it down. Many guys, I've treated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guys over the years, hurt their back shoveling, right? If you have eight or 10 pounds of dirt here, then because you lose mechanical advantage, you can throw that dirt a long ways over here, but it's like picking up 30 or 40 pounds of pressure because you lose mechanical advantage, okay? Our example of that is when you do the biceps curl, yes? Right? There's the fulcrum right there. The load is the dumbbell I'm holding. And where do the muscles attach? The muscles attach down here. So it's load, effort, effort coming from the muscles, and fulcrum. The fulcrum's way back here. So I can move that from there way up to here, right? But I lose mechanical advantage, okay? I don't get extra strength. I lose mechanical advantage. But that is called a speed lever, okay? First class lever, like a teeter-totter. I have mechanical advantage. I have a lot of strength with that. And I can move a heavy load, yes? Right? Okay? Second class lever, I have mechanical advantage, but I can only move at a short distance, okay? And it's a wheelbarrow. I go to lift up, I only lift that about that much because the fulcrum's way we're at the, in the middle of that wheel there, right? Your third class lever, in your book it shows a pair of tweezers, which I don't, I don't relate to, but anyway, okay? Third class lever is a speed lever because you can pick it up and throw it over there. Pick it up and throw it way over there, right? It's a speed lever. You can do things quickly, okay? But the key is the effort's in the middle between these two, and that's why you don't have as much mechanical. Okay? And again, the bones are the levers. The muscles provide the effort. And the joints are the fulcrums, right? So, one of my good friends, his son got a mechanical engineering degree from tech. I had to ask him a couple of questions a couple of uh, years ago. Now let's go over this sheet, okay? Let's go over these sheets, all right? Yes? Okay, here we go. The ones that are circled are the ones you need to know. Let's go, let's go about them, let's talk about them, right? Yes? Okay. Number one, temporalis, right? Yes? Right here, temporalis, right? That would, that's your temple, right? When those spasm, when you wake up in the morning, oh, God, I got a headache. Oh, right there, right? You've been grinding your teeth, and those are spasming. Temporalis, okay? Temporalis, okay? These muscles here, so you can grind your food. The masseter. That for its size is about the strongest muscle in the body. For its size, okay? It's very strong. That's why you can, right? I have a sister that used to grind the eyes. You know, people like that. Anyway, right? Masseter. Okay? Right? Okay. Obicularis, oculi, and oris. Obicularis, right? It's a round muscle. Oculi, your eye, right? Your eye. You go to Rome, you go to uh, the Parthenon, it's a big dome building. In the middle, there's a oculus. It doesn't look that big, but it's six feet apart. And it has no covering. And I was in there, and it was raining. 
and it was raining. And it's, I'm like, oh, gee. And you go to Amarillo, and you go in the men's bathroom, and there's a picture of it there, the dome. It's amazing. Okay? So I'm like, oh, been there, done that. Okay? So, uh, deltoid, right? These are your delts right here. You got an anterior, middle, and posterior, right? One of the workouts I do is anterior for the dumbbells, middle, and posterior delts, right? Work the front, the middle, and the back, deltoid, right? Yes, and again, that's because they're triangular shape. Okay, deltoid. Okay. Obviously, this is your biceps break eye. Break eye means arm, biceps. And this is the triceps. Remember, because there's one, two, and one of them attaches over onto the shoulder blade. Three different heads, so that's the triceps. Okay, right? Now, when we get down to the thigh, I'm just going to say quadriceps, right? You don't have to know the individual ones. I'm just going to say quadriceps. These muscles right here are the quadriceps, right? Okay, that's as specific as I'm going to get for this class, right? Now, now, you have a muscle on the front of your shin over here, and it allows you to do this, right? It allows you to pull that toe up. Yes? Oh, by the way, when you get little tears in this muscle along the front, it hurts to do what? And what is that called? Shin, shin, shin. shin splints, right? Yes? Anterior tibialis. Tears in the anterior tibialis, right? Yes? You run too many miles too soon. You haven't built your bones up yet, your muscles up yet, right? Or you run on really hard surfaces when you're only used to running on sand or softer surfaces, right? So, tibialis anterior, okay? Now, your gastroc and your soleus, okay? The back of your calf, you have your gastrocs that come down like this, right? Those are your calf muscles here, yes? Okay, medial and lateral gastroc, and underneath those, there's a muscle shape like that, and that is a soleus, soleus, okay? That's why when they teach you to stretch your calves, and they always teach you to do this, right? You gotta do that, but you also have to bend your knee and do that to stretch the soleus underneath to take the two gastrocs out of it, okay? Because you need to stretch your gastrocs, but you need to stretch your soleus too, right? Together, those are called, it's not on there, triceps surae, right? Triceps surae, three muscles of the leg, right? Okay, so again, the ones you can see are your calf muscles, right? I had a friend in college, he had two cats. One was named Gastroc and the other was named Nemius. He's a strange guy, you can imagine. <laughs> okay, but anyway, again, soleus up underneath it, right? Okay, now. This one right here, right across there, yes? It attaches to my sternum. It attaches to a process up under there called the clidoid. It also attaches to the mastoid. Sternum, clido, mastoid, SCM, right? And it allows me to do this when it contracts, right? Flexion and rotation, pull that head over here or over here, right? Yes, sometimes it goes into spasm. Have you seen people that are always like that? Their head is always crooked like that? Right? Some people are born like that. I had a friend, his daughter was born like that, and they cut the SCM, she straightened her head up, and it grew back together, and then it curved again, right? And such. So. Sternocleidomastoid, and again, it's named for where it attaches. Sternum, cleidoid process up in there, and mastoid right there, right? Yes, a big powerful muscle. Okay, sternocleidomastoid. Okay, pec major, right? Your pec major here, and then underneath it, your pec minor, right? And those allow you to do this or this, right? 
You want to build your pecs up, you do the bench press, right? Or like me, I'm sitting on the boat flex and I do that. Right? I also do the this. That exercise too. Yes? Because that works more the inside. Yes? Okay. Some people lay down on an elevated bench and do bench press that way to work the upper. But anyway. Okay? So, pectoralis major and minor. Yes? In between your ribs, you have intercostals, right? Intercostals, right? This is the costal cartilage, right? Remember, it's highly cartilage. And the intercostals, right? You have external and internal intercostals. Yes, we'll talk about that in a future chapter. Okay? Down the front, rectus abdominis, right? Rectus abdominis, right? The guy that has a six pack. When I was in high school, I was so skinny. I had the six pack. You could see them all. Right? That's rectus abdominis. Okay? Right down the middle, linea alba, the white line. But anyway. Okay? Okay. The obliques come across. Right? Oblique at an angle. Yes? And the obliques, you do crunchies and you raise up and you do that. Right? Because the obliques across here, they contract. Right? And so those are the obliques, because they come at an angle. They're not straight up and down. They come in at an angle from up here down to there, from up here down to there. They're obliques, right? Okay. Tensor fascia lata along here. Tensor fascia lata incorporated into the iliotibial band, right? The IT band goes down and attaches right here. Helps us to move our leg out, but also takes a lot of punishment when we run, run, run. Have you heard of tibial IT band syndrome, the runners? Yeah, very common, okay? So, uh, tensor fascia lata, TFL, right? Right up here, okay? Okay, that's all on the front. And on the back, on the back is trapezius. And again, the trapezius starts here and it comes across to here, and then it goes down. It's shaped like a trapezoid. It's shaped like that, 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 that. And here's your shoulders here, right? But the trapezius is across here, yes? Now, when I do the deadlift on the bowflex, I raise up, okay, with proper posture. And after I've done my deadlift, then I do shoulder shrugs. And these muscles contract, right? And it gives you more definition in your shoulders, right? Okay. When it goes into spasm, oh, ow. sometimes that hurts. But anyway, okay. Trapezius. We already talked about the deltoid, anterior, middle, and, and on the back, it's a posterior deltoid. They're showing that, right? Okay. Triceps brachii, right? Brachii meaning arm, triceps, it's three head. That's your triceps allows you to do that. Yes? Triceps. Okay? Okay. Your rhomboid major. We talked about that. The rhomboid is... The rhomboids come across to the shoulder blades. Okay? Now... I recommend this exercise a lot to my patients. When we're young, we stand up straight like this, and as we get older, we do this. Right? Okay? So, to try to fight against that, this gravity and age, but to fight against that, what do we do? First exercise. One, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? To try and strengthen these muscles to help hold us up straighter and to pull those shoulders back when those shoulders get rounded, that's very bad. Some people, PTs, even recommend you do it with your arms up. Pull those shoulder blades together. One, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. That's the rhomboids. Okay? That's to help you keep keep you standing up straight. Okay? Okay? Latissimus dorsi, your lats over here. Have to be very strong to do a bunch of pull-ups. 
have to be very strong. Your lats attach up here, right? Cross here, lats, latissimus dorsi, right? Right? And you see, I do the exercise. You bend over, you get a pretty heavy weight from doing this, right? Bend over rows for the lats, all of this, okay? Right? It'll fill your chest out across here. That's it. Right? Okay? So, we use a pretty heavy load for that, okay? On the back, it's a group of muscles. I'm just going to say uh, hamstrings, back of your leg. Okay. This is an introductory course. This is not, you know, a year of a, a just strictly anatomy. So we're just going to say hamstrings. Most people know what that term means. Okay. Gluteus maximus and medius, right? The maximus and the medius. Yeah. Okay. And again, iliotibial band or iliotibial tract here. TFL. Iliotibial band attaching right down there. Runners have a lot of trouble, especially if they're over pronators like I am. Okay? We already talked about the gastrocnemius and the soleus up underneath it. And it also has Achilles tendon. Okay? I'm going to ask you some of these on your lab final. I'm just telling you. Right? Remember we did this at the start? We had those words, right? And I picked out some of those words and you had to write them down. Yes? It's very simple. There's no trick. Right? Almost every bodybuilder knows these muscles. Okay? Right? Pretty simple. You either know or you don't. Yes? Okay? Now, you notice I tried to talk about the muscles because if I talk about it, you'll associate it and think. Right? So that's why I do that, to try and get you to remember it, okay? Okay, anyway, there's that. Okay, that is chapter 10. Now, we shall carry on to chapter 11. Okay. Okay, now. You need to really start working on your project and getting your idea for your project and start getting that nailed down because we only have about two more weeks, right? And such, and I would like the, the uh, projects turned in uh, maybe on Wednesday before the finals is on Monday, okay? Generally what I do during the summer is technically the finals on Tuesday, and then the second session of this class starts on Wednesday, right? Well, that sucks, not even one day off. So I usually give the final on Monday. I'm usually finished by then. And then you get one day, Tuesday off, or I get one day off. And then Wednesday, we start the second session of this, okay? So that's what that's about. Uh, anyway, okay? Let's see here the next chapter. Chapter 11. Okay, chapter 11. 11 through 14 are neuro. The nervous system is much smaller than the muscular system, much smaller than our abdominal organs and our all of that, but guess what? It's the boss. It controls everything, right? Okay? It controls everything. It's very, very important. Okay, find my place. Okay. Sensory input. Sensory input, right? Sensory receptors monitor conditions, yes? S E N S O R Y. Sensory input, right? P T T P pain temp touch pressure, right? Yes. Your senses. Yes. Your senses. Right? Proprioception. 
pardon me, proprioception. P R O P R I. Proprioception. Right? Let me explain proprioception. Proprioception is really very simple. Yes? Right? The guy pulls you over, he says, uh, Sir, step out of the car. Right? And he starts giving you the, the uh, alcohol test. Yeah? Yes? One well, of the first things he says to do is close your eyes. Hold your arms to your side and touch the tip of your nose, right? That's proprioception. Where my limbs are in space. Yes? Balance. Right? Balance. That's why the gymnastic, the little ladies that do gymnastics are so great at rock climbing. Because they know where their limbs are in space. They can balance. Okay? Proprioception is. Yes? My arm's supposed to go like this, but if somebody grabs it and pulls it back, it ain't supposed to go there, right? And such. Proprioception. Yes? Now, now, okay. Uh, yeah, let's stand up for just a second, if you would. We're going to take a real quick test. Right? Now, if you flunk this test, it's not good. That means that there's a very... Good chance you won't be around within the next two years. Okay? All right? Everybody do this for me. All right? What we're going to do is I'll stand this way so you can see me. We're going to stand here. I'm going to look at my watch. We're going to lift here and we're going to put one leg right there. And we're going to do that. Ready? Okay? Oh, you're already doing it. Okay. <laughs> Another five or six seconds, right? If you can do that for 10 seconds, guess what? That's very good. If you can't do that, you got problems. You got real problems. And there's a much higher chance you won't be around in like two years. Okay? That's good. You can do it. Now do the other leg. Right? See? Let me explain. You get visual input from your eyes. You got your vestibular system working. You got your muscles working. You got your cerebellum. Right? Yes? And so all of those things have to be working good for you to do that for 10 seconds. If you can do it longer than 10 seconds, that's fine. Most young people, y'all can do it for as long as you want to. But you take a 65-year-old guy that smoked for 40 years and uh, is not doing so well. That's good. You, sorry. <laughs> sorry. But anyway, right? No. That's a very good test. There's another test, and that is you put your feet together like this, and you sit down, and then you have to get up without touching your hands with your legs. And that tests muscle strength, too. That's another very good one. Older people, if they can't do that, it means they're frail. And if they're very frail, that means there's a good chance they're not going to be around in a few years. Yes? Okay. That's just another very simple test, <coughs> right, that shows that. But anyway, proprioception, where your limbs are in space, okay? And again, your hands, your legs, where your head is in space, right? Okay? But anyway, that's sensory input. Integration. I-N-T-E-G-R-A-T-I-O-N, -E right? That's thinking. That's why I put it. Thinking about the sensory input and deciding what to do, right? And then you got your motor output. You got your motor output, right? Yes. So my example of that is this, right? About 37 years ago, I'm sitting in church and wow, there's a good looking woman about three pews in front of me, right? Visual, sensory input. Yeah, so as soon as it was over, what did I do? I went up there. Hi, young lady, how are you? Right? Yes? Yes? Right? So I decided, man, I'm going to meet this gal. Right? Yes? And then the motor output was what? I got off my fanny and I went up there. I beat all the other guys to her, too. Yes? Now, it took a year and a half to get her to marry me. But anyway, it was, you know touch and go there for a while, but sensory input, integration, what you're going to do about it, and motor output. 
motor to the muscles, right? Da, da, da. Skeletal muscles, right? Okay. There you go. Okay. Now, we already talked about, like in the first chapter, afferent versus efferent. Afferent. Away from the periphery to the brain. The brain decides what to do. It sends signals to the muscle. Efferent. Afferent. Efferent. Right? Make sure you get that. Okay? Afferent. Away from the periphery. Efferent. Down to the periphery. Okay? Make sure you get that. Okay. Now, i got to draw a big diagram and go through the nervous system, the whole nervous system. It's going to take me a minute. If you want to take a break, relax for a minute, if you need a drink or go pee or something, I'm going to have to be drawing this, so take, take, take a break for a minute, okay? Mm -hmm.